Okay, welcome to our review for exam one. Starting with number one, determine whether the underlying value is a parameter or statistic. Uh, number one states, uh, in a survey conducted in a town of Atherton, 25% of adults' uh, respondents reported that they had been involved in at least one car accident over the past 10 years. Okay, so the question then becomes, what is so special about this number 25%? Does that 25% refer to the entire population, or does it refer to a statistic? Uh, and in this case, they actually come out and say very clearly that they talk to adult respondents. So those are they actually talk to adults, and of the adults they talk to, 25% said whatever they said. All right. So the fact that we are dealing with a uh, sample means that we are dealing with something called a statistic. So this 25% refers to statistic. Uh, number two, 28.2% of the mayors uh, of cities in a certain state are from minority groups. Uh, in this case, uh, they are referring to the population of the mayors. Population of the mayors. So population of mayors. Um, so because it's dealing with a population measurement, we would refer to this as a parameter. Okay, number three and four were asked to identify uh, qualitative versus quantitative. Uh, just a quick reminder, qualitative, those are verbal expressions um, or data that's described by qualities or words. Uh, quantitative are th things like numbers, uh, numerical answers of some type. So number three, the colors of book covers on a bookshelf. So if I was collecting data, uh, along those lines, I would expect to hear answers like red, brown, yellow, uh, and so those are qualities, and that means that uh, we're looking at qualitative data. Uh, the number of calls received at a company's help desk, uh, I would expect to hear numbers like 30 or 20 or 15, so I'd expect to hear numbers, and so that's a quantity, so quantitative data. Uh, number f uh, the next question, determine whether the quantitative data is discrete or continuous. Uh, again, discrete means that there is a, fine, a fixed value that we can have. Uh, we can have two of something, three of something, four of something. Uh, continuous means that we can have uh, a fractional part, a decimal part included. And it really just depends on our accuracy as far as how far we want to go. Uh, the one exception being money. Money we measure out at two decimal places, so we can't infinitely expand that. So money would be sort of a counterexample, but it is uh, money is discrete. Anyways, going on. Uh, number five, the number of bottles of juice sold in a cafeteria during lunch. So if I asked how many bottles were sold, I would hear, expect to hear like 300 or 350. And if they said 350.2, I'd, I'd look at them funny and go, what do, what do you mean 0 0.2? Like, he's still drinking it? Um... So that would be a discrete variable. Uh, the weight of a player on a wrestling team. So weight, um, I would expect to hear 180 pounds, three ounces, and you know, however accurate they wanted to measure him, they could. Um, so that would be an example of continuous data. Number seven. Determine whether the study depicts an observational, uh, determine whether it's observational or experimental. Uh, a poll is conducted in which professional musicians are asked their ages. Um, there's no experiment being performed here. No one's having a, a treatment applied. Um, they're just saying, how old are you? Um, so this would be an observational study. Uh, number eight, uh, scientists, scientist was studying the effects of new fertilizer on crop yield. She randomly assigned half of plots on the farm to group one and the remaining to group two on uh, the plots in group one, the new fertilizers. Okay, so now she's putting fertilizer on something. So she's actually changing something, uh, applying what's called a treatment. So this is clearly an experiment of some type. Uh, number nine, we are given a set of 
uh, what's called a sampling frame, where we've taken a, a population and numbered them. And then we're given a set of random numbers and asked to determine a sample. Uh, so it says top 38 cities in Wisconsin are determined by population given below. Select a random sample of four. So we want four members to be in our sample. Uh, from the list below, using two-digit uh, list of random numbers provided, begin with the uppermost left and proceed down each column. When a column is complete, use the numbers at the top to the next right. Okay, so they're saying, they, they're telling us they want us to go down. Technically, with random digits, um, we can just sort of determine whether we go across or down. But if I go down, uh, I see 21 is my first number. And 21 corresponds to Mantle Walk. Sure, why not? Uh, then I got 12. And 12 corresponds to Lacrosse. Uh, then I have 23, corresponds to Franklin. Uh, then I have 44. Now, 44 is outside of my sampling frame, so I'm not going to use it. Uh, 8 would be my next one. And 8, where are you? Uh, Oshkosh. That's what that corresponds to. So those four cities would be my sample using this particular random digit table. Now, technically, we could go across, and we'd still get a different random sample, but that's what randomness is. It's uh, taking our own opinion out of it and using some co completely random number generator to figure out who we should ask. Okay, number 10 and 11, uh, we are identifying which type of sampling method we are using. So in class, we talked about several different types of sampling, um, anywhere from a simple random sample, multi-stage, uh, stratified cluster, uh, etc. Uh, systematic, I'm sorry, that's the other one. Uh, so number 10, every fifth adult entering an airport is checked for extra security screening. Um, so the fact that they're, they're starting every fifth, that's actually an example of systematic. Uh, at a local technical school, five auto repair classes are randomly selected and all of the students from each class are interviewed which sampling method is used. So uh, they randomly pick a type and then interview everyone within each of those classes. So this would be an example of a cluster sample. Uh, OK, so number 12, we're abandoning this sampling type. And now we're going to look at bias. Uh, so a local hardware store wants to know if its customers are satisfied with the customer service they received. The store posts an interview at the front of the store to ask the first 100 shoppers who leave the store. How satisfied on a scale of 1 to 10 are you with, uh, were you with this store's customer service? Determine the types of bias. Okay. Um, well, so the first thing is let's just kind of go through uh, what, what sort of draws our attention to what might be the problem here. And the fact that they're standing there and asking the first 100 shoppers to leave the store, so they're not randomly selecting a sample. Um, they're just saying we want to talk to the first 100 people. Uh, that's going to influence people who apparently wanted to run to the store um, first. So if they were trying to go there first, they're, they're tending to already know what they want and probably excited about that particular store. So in this case, it's going to be a little bit of a convenience bias. It's just convenient to stand out out front and just talk to the first 100 people. Um, and so again, that's, that's sort of going to influence the data positively towards the store. Uh, now, I do want to encourage you to review other types of bias, uh, response bias, voluntary response, non-response, uh, wording of the question. Um, there's other types that we looked at. So even if convenience is not one of the choices, there's other types of bias that we, you want to make sure that you are at least uh, aware of how to look for. All right. Uh, and then the next part of our exam looks at uh, data and how to organize it and in this case, um, we're going to draw what's called a frequency distribution and then a relative frequency distribution. Um, so this first case, we're just organizing data. We're not necessarily looking at pictures of it. So I'm going to make a list of my data. So I see yellow, red, blue, uh, purple, and green, I think is it. We'll see. 
All right, so frequency distribution, frequency refers to how often something shows up. So I want to count um, how many yellows and reds and blues to start off with. So I'm just going to do what's called a tally mark. So I see a yellow, I see two reds, I see one blue, another yellow, uh, two more reds and one more blue, another blue, another yellow, two purples, another purple, uh, two more reds and a purple, another red, a blue, purple, and a green. Okay, all right, now the tallies just sort of give me a way to organize this. Next up would be the frequencies. So the frequencies actually are how many there are. So three, seven, four, five, and one. Okay, and then the, free, uh, the relative frequency. So relative refers to uh, some sort of fraction or percent of the data is in that particular category. Uh, so I need to know how many total numbers there were, so I can either just go back and count, or let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So there's 20 total uh, colors, so my relative frequency in this case would be 3 out of 20, 7 out of 20, 4 out of 20, 5 out of 20, and 1 out of 20. Okay, and I think I'm going to just label this at the bottom so we are aware of this. So this is my frequency... This is relative frequency. And I'm going to I'm going to keep going just for a second cuz we did look at other different types of ways to organize this. And I just want to make sure that if this shows up on a test, sort of hint hint, um, that we know what I'm talking about. So I want to do what's called the cumulative frequency and a cumulative relative frequency. So a cumulative um, would be count as I go. So 3, 3 plus 7 is 10, plus another 4 is 14, 19, and 20. And cumulative relative frequency just refers to, again, fraction of the whole. So 3 out of 20, 10 out of 20, 14 out of 20, 19 out of 20, and 20 out of 20. So just be aware you might see the words cumulative frequency and cumulative relative frequency. Number 14, a random sample of 30 high school students is selected. Each student is asked how much time he or she spent on the internet during the previous week. Describe the graph. The following times are recorded. And then construct a frequency uh, histogram for this data. Uh, so the first thing I want to do is I just want to organize this. Um, now, I, would, I could just type this in my calculator, or I could just type it in Excel. Um, it's actually small enough that I can just get away with organizing it. So I see that the uh, smallest number I see is 5. So I'm just going to do 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, and 14. And we're going to kind of set up just a quick chart and how many of each category there are. And again, Excel or your calculator can kind of help speed this process up. Uh, so I'm just going to do a little, little tally marks. So there's a 6, there's a 9, there's a 5, uh, 14. And I don't really think you want to watch me do this. So I'm going to pause it, and I'm going to fill out the rest of these tally marks. Um, so again, you can do that, or you can continue watching. Um, just make sure we compare. OK, so after I filled out my data, this is what I got. Um, I got there are four fives, five sixes, seven sevens, uh, five eights, four nines, two tens, two elevens, and two fourteens. OK, so a frequency histogram is based upon how high or how, many, how often a certain observation occurs. So I'm going to set up my bottom, and I'm going to set it up using the same scale that I just wrote a second ago as far as going down. And 14, and it looks like the highest uh, is 6. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Okay. Uh, 1, 2, 3, do that. Okay. 
So then what I want to do is, above each number, I want to center a rectangle that's, uh, that's the same height as the, the frequency there. So there are four fives. So we'll do that. And there are five sixes, so a little bit higher. And there are seven sevens, or six sevens, I'm sorry. Uh, eights have five. Uh, nines have four, tens have two, and elevens have two, and then fourteen has two. Okay, so that's our frequency histogram. Uh, and then there's this little phrase that showed up right in the middle um, that I want to emphasize, uh, describe the data. So anytime we're asked to describe the data, we want to look at four sentences. Uh, we want to see USS. Uh, I want a number that represents the center. And now for this particular exercise, I, I want to just mention that this is going to be an estimated thing. I realize we could type all of our numbers in and get the actual mean um, or median. Um, and that's actually a good review question is what should we use? Uh, but we, again, we're just going to estimate this um, on this part, because on the test, um, I'm actually going to give you a graph of this and ask this sort of question. I'm going to give you some raw data, too. But uh, So the center appears to be around 7 and 8. Uh, now, there is some skewness to this. So I would say um, that we want to go with uh, what's called the median. And with the median, I want to do what's called the uh, a cumulative frequency just a second here so if I'm going to count how many there are and then count up knowing that there's 30 numbers so uh, let's see so we start off with four fives then we had another five so that puts us at nine then we add another uh, six puts us at 15 that's 19 23 25 27 and 29 oh no I'm off a number Oh, that's terrible. Um, well, I'm still okay. I'm still okay with it. <laughs> I'm going to leave it like this. Um, okay, so if there's 30 numbers, then the median should occur right around 7. So the median is going to show up right about here in my chart, which is what it, what it shows up kind of for me as well. So I'm going to say the median is about there. Uh, so I'm going to say that the center of this data, the median, is about... 7. And the reason why I said median is it's skewed data. So there's a, an outlier it looks like, and that's another category we'll talk about. So anytime we're looking at skewed data, I want to use the median to describe the center. Uh, the U stands for unusual. So I'm looking for gaps or outliers. And I see there's a gap from 12 and 13, an outlier at 14. So I'm just going to say that gap at 12, 13... And it looks like an outlier at 14. Uh, then we have S and S. So one S stands for shape. The other one stands for spread. So shape, uh, we already said it's skewed. Uh, and now I can add a direction to that. So it's actually skewed right. Uh, skewness, of course, is defined by the tail of the data. And the last one is spread. Now, spread could be uh, standard deviation. It could be IQR. It could also be range. And since I'm, I'm not basing this off the numbers, I base it off the picture, uh, I'm going to say that the range is from 14 minus 5. So that means that the data has a range of 9. Um, there we go.